All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Level One Podcast. I'm DSP, and happy Mother's Day. That is right. Today is Sunday, the 14th of May, 2023. It is Mother's Day. And so, happy Mom's Day to all the moms out there. And for those of you who uh, have a mom who's still around, I strongly recommend you do something with them today, or talk to them, or just call and say hi. Send them an email, send them a text, do something. You may not realize it, but that little bit of contact that just, hey, what's up, mom, hope you're having a good day, might actually be a game changer. It does mean something. It really does. Personally, I uh, will be calling my mother today and having a nice conversation with her about how everything's going. Uh, I usually call my parents once a week anyway, but on this case, I actually scheduled my call for today on Mother's Day uh, so that we could talk a little bit about the holiday and see what's going on. All right? <clears throat> Even if uh, you know you don't live anywhere near your parents like me, uh, they're going to appreciate it. You know, my, Your mother will appreciate the call unless you had a falling out, in which case... I guess you do what's best for you. I don't know. But anyway, uh, traditionally on Mother's Day, there's many things that happen. Sometimes, uh, you know, you take your mom out to dinner. Sometimes you get her something. I used to actually take my mom out to dinner on Mother's Day. Uh, Usually we would go to one of her favorite restaurants, um, one of which was a seafood restaurant down on the waterfront. And they would have, she loved fried clams. So we would actually go and get these delicious fried clams uh, from the place. Usually I would get shrimp. I liked shrimp. But she would get fried clams and some fries and stuff like that. Um, you know, many years ago, the good thing is Mother's Day is, you know, spring. And usually the, the, the weather is warmer. And it was nice to go down at this, this like, uh, waterfront uh, seafood restaurant in, uh, in Connecticut. So, But, of course, you know, I haven't lived there in about a decade. Um, so how's everyone doing today? I hope you're doing well. I hope I find your weekend well. Uh, we have a few things to talk about today. Nothing too major. A few updates and a few kind of housekeeping things. Today's show will be a lot of kind of chill, laid-back attitude and probably some Q&A. Uh, I just want to say this up front. Uh, you know, today I'm not in the best of moods and it has nothing to do with you guys again. Yes, it's personal stuff behind the scenes. It's bothering me. Um, it, you know, puts me on edge. It makes me feel sad, upset. But it's it's life. When you get you know, get older, particularly, it's stuff that you got to deal with. And, uh, you know, it might be on the back of my mind today. You know, my goal is to have a fun, full day of streaming with all of you. Double gameplay stream day today. Help take my mind off of the stuff that's happening here in real life so that I can, uh, you know, have a good time with my audience, you know? And I think for a lot of people, that's the purpose that these these streams serve, right? It takes your mind off of all the nonsense, all the stress, all the, the stuff of real life that bothers you and allows you to just sit here for maybe a, five minutes or maybe a couple hours, whatever it is, and have a good time with, with someone else on, on the other side of the internet. Whether it's me particularly or other people in the community. You know, it's a great time. I really enjoy this uh, experience I have with you guys every day. So I hope that you guys uh, get something out of it. I'm looking to get something out of it too today, you know. Uh, it goes both ways. <clears throat> and so, I'll say this up front as well. As you know, we have a no drama policy on the chat. And what that means is that we're not going to have people coming in here trying to derail the stream with outside drama from, you know completely unrelated to what we're doing on the streams. Uh, not to say that you can't talk about other stuff, but if you try to derail, you try to bring up nonsensical drama, no, you know, crap, it's just not going to be entertained on my, my content. And understand, it's always been against the rules. And uh, if you get moderated, you know, not much I can do about that. Got to pay attention and uh, don't bring up nonsense, okay? Especially today. Like I said already, I'm kind of in a, in a, not in a great mindset. So coming into this, you know, I'm trying to basically, you know, readjust myself and have a good time with you guys, right? All right, so anyway, today is Sunday. We're halfway through the streaming week, right? We're now heading into the second half of my streaming week this week. And uh, at this point now, I've played Zelda Tears of the Kingdom seven hours. I, I really like the game, but already, you know, seven hours in, I'm starting to see some shortcomings of the game uh, that definitely I think are going to be things that maybe are going to hold back this playthrough, all right? And I know some people already, oh, he's being nitpicky. Well, listen, it's kind of my job to be nitpicky, is it not? I'm someone who plays games and objectively reviews them from a standpoint of kind of an almost an outsider, right? I'm not someone in the industry who depends on kissing butt or on slamming games either. I can be honest about what I feel about a game. And so far with Zelda, it's mostly positive. But I can tell you right now from playing seven hours in, I'm already starting to see some issues. So issue number one, all right, 
This game, if you're not aware, has three different worlds. Yes. There is a sky world of a bunch of floating islands, and I guess you could compare that either to, like, Skyward Sword or to, like, Wind Waker, where it feels like you're kind of in a sea and there's all this stuff you can travel between and explore. Then you've got your standard overworld, which is the planet level, which is kind of like Breath of the Wild. It, in fact, it is Breath of the Wild, right? It literally, I think, is the same map, just re-explored and redesigned. But now, we found out last night, there's a third world under the surface of the planet called The Depths, some people are comparing this to, say, the dark world of other Zelda games. And people have told me, oh yeah, by the way, uh, that map is exactly the same size as the standard overworld map. And I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, now Breath of the Wild, which I played six years ago, alright? I really enjoyed it, don't get me wrong. But I particularly remember, by the time that we were getting near the, like, the last third of the game, that it definitely felt like the game was dragging on, that it was taking too long. And that you were just like, just, you know, wrap it up, right? Just wrap it up. There's so much to do. I wish we could just get to the end of this game. It really felt like it was taking too long. If you take a look at my Breath of the Wild playthrough, 194 parts. And this was a time frame when my parts were between 20 and 30 minutes long. So you're talking the playthrough was between 80 to 100 hours long, okay? I remember when I started playing Breath of the Wild, everyone liked it on stream. And by the time we got to about halfway through the game, everyone was actually getting frustrated, saying, man, this game is too long. And I think it is a major thing that we need to start talking about in the modern era, game length, okay? At what point is a game too short, too long, or hitting that perfect happy medium spot in the middle? Because I do feel like game developers these days don't really consider this. Or, for example, some game developers just want games to be so long, but is everything you're doing in the game meaningful, right? I would much rather play a 20 to 25 hour streamlined, linear, awesome experience than an 80 hour open world bloated experience where like 50 hours of gameplay are pretty unnecessary and, and bent on backtracking and open world exploring. Um, not to say that those games don't have a place, but that's kind of my personal preference. Like, I think I would prefer a game that just has like, oh my god, every moment I'm playing it, it's great story, great graphics, really cool exploration, really awesome, you know, hitting it on, on every octane, high cylinder enjoyment, rather than, all right, so this is a downtime where we're going to be running through the open world for four hours, and we might find three useful things today. You know what I mean? Um, when I take a look at a game like, like Tears of the Kingdom, and you say, well, Nintendo's charging $70 for it, okay? You immediately say, well, why do they think that they can justify $10 more? Well, based on what I'm seeing now seven hours in, I think I know where their justification's coming from. They're basically saying, it's Breath of the Wild plus up here plus down here. You know, we've essentially almost doubled the, number, the, the, the content from the first game. But it begs the question, do modern gamers want an experience that's 100 plus hours long is it going to hold interest and is it going to actually be interesting that entire time or are you going to get bored, right? Um, it'll be interesting because the thing is with a game like Zelda Tears of the Kingdom, there's no achievements. There's no trophies. So there's no real way to gauge how many people who buy the game will actually finish it. You know what I mean? Like if you look at a lot of uh, statistics for video games, modern video games, it's interesting because if you look at games that, for example, are on Game Pass... A tremendous amount of people play them because they're under Game Pass and you don't have to pay any more money for them. But how many people actually finish them? Right? Now with a game like Tears of the Kingdom, we've been waiting six years for a new Zelda game. The hype is real. Ridiculous amounts of people ran out and bought it. And let's face it, you also have the Nintendo fanboy force that literally buys every piece of Nintendo possible. Probably some of them bought like 12 copies of the game. I hate to say it, but it's just, it's just true. Oh, I want the collector's edition, I want the standard edition, but I also got the digital edition. Oh, I have, a, I have a Switch, my brother has an OLED Switch, my mom has a Switch, and everyone needs it, you know? So I guarantee you this game sold like, like crazy, right? But I guess the question again is, out of all those copies being bought, if the game is going to be over 100 hours long with this insane amount of content they've added into it, how many people will actually play it to completion? Or how many people will pick it up play it for 20 hours, be like, alright, it's an open world Zelda, I get it, and then never play it again, right? 
Now, here's the thing. I approach things from a different perspective. I approach it from the perspective of a content creator, all right? Not only am I playing a game for myself, I'm playing it for you. I'm not just sitting here and 100 hours of my personal time. This is me actually putting out a lengthy playthrough for you and trying to entertain an audience of hundreds and then on demand an audience of thousands, right? Um, and it can be tricky because I feel like with a game like, like the Tears of the Kingdom, if we approach this from an interactive content creator's perspective, if we play this game and it's the game that we talk, we chill, we have fun conversation while entire two to three hour streams, all I'm doing is exploring the open world, doing some temples, opening up some map, you know, portions, maybe do a dungeon here or there, whatever it may be, as long as we are interacting, right? I think it can work. But even then, if you take a look at a game like, for example, Oblivion, that's exactly the take that we've, we've had with Oblivion. And I've been playing Oblivion since December. Currently, as of today, when we resume Oblivion on the late stream, I'm around 72 hours into Oblivion. And I can tell you right now, it feels like it's time to end the playthrough. It feels like it's exhausting at this point. Like, dude, we've been playing Oblivion for a really long time, and I feel like it's time to move on from it. And we're 72 hours in. But did you hear what I just said? 72 hours. Breath of the Wild was 80 plus hours. Tears of the Kingdom reportedly is over 100 hours. You understand? <laughs> so, again, I have to say this, length of game maybe has to start to be really explored by these game developers. Right? It's not all about possibly making the longest possible game with the most amount of content. It's about meaningful content. And how much content in this game will be meaningful? I have to ask the question. You know, I haven't I haven't gotten far enough into the game to make a judgment yet. But the question is, is now resonating in my mind. Especially when, keep in mind, this is not the only game that I'm currently playing. I'm playing Star Wars, which we're about to play today. We'll talk about that in a second. I'm still doing my second run of Elden Ring, which has been superb, and I cannot wait to play more of that. Uh, we've got chill late night streams of Final Fantasy V and Oblivion. And coming up in June, we've got really big high profile games that I'm excited to play. So how am I supposed to be playing a 100 to 120 hour long game, right? Even, uh, let's be honest here, a normal person who doesn't do what I do for a living, who has a job, a family, you're in school, you have responsibilities, you can't just sit around playing games all day. Realistically, how many hours a day does a normal person have to play games? A couple hours maybe? You expect me to play this game for three months? And I'm still going to have interest in it? You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. At this point, I'm starting to actually strongly question game developers' logic when it comes to the way that they're developing games. Like, I don't need a ginormous open game with a bunch of padding. I just want a game that's streamlined and good. And you know what? I hate to say it. That's what Zelda games used to be. If you take a look at Zelda games, right? Yes, they always had some optional hidden content, but for the most part... They actually were some pretty nice experiences where everything was kind of curated and, and created just for an awesome hands-on experience. Every time you were in a dungeon, there's stuff just for that dungeon or whatever. Now that they've made these games giant and bloated, is it really going to have that same feeling? And is it going to, or is it going to be, oh, 120 hours, but out of the 120 hours, only like 30 hours was fun, but you spent five months playing the game, right? Now, I do have another thing to ask, all right? Because... Already I'm seven hours in and I've now completed eight dungeons. I, I take that back, temples. They're not called dungeons, they're called temples. It's the same premise as the temples in Breath of the Wild. There are many challenge areas where you're going to use your game's like puzzle-solving abilities, the new ones, you know, the combining, the uh, uh, rewind ability, the rise ability where you float and go through things. You're going to use these to solve puzzles, all right? And... You get rewards. Now, if you just beat the shrine, you get an upgrade item. And for every four, I believe you either get a new heart or you get more stamina. So that's good. But there's optional items in the game, or in the, in the uh, dungeons. Okay? And here's where I'm starting to actually get legit upset and I'm only seven hours in. So every optional dungeon, or every, every temple that I've done, I've tried to do the optional objective. And the optional objective, arguably, is much harder than the standard objective. You have to figure out, like, an extra way to do 
the puzzle solving, the traversal, whatever it is to get this extra chest, okay? I've opened up eight of these. Literally, every single one is a complete waste of your time. There has not been a single optional chest I've opened that had anything of use. Last night, I mean, the last thing I did on my Zelda stream was an optional uh, temple. We figured out how to complete it, and then there was the optional chest. So, okay, let's figure this out. So we figure it out. It took a while. It was tough. It was actually quite challenging because you had to make a, a, a thing that was in the way, have to be suspended in the air, and then you had to hit a ball with a timing and had to hit a target. So we figure all this out. It took like 15 minutes to figure out the second half. We go and we open the chest. It's an elixir. It's a stamina elixir. The same stamina elixir you can easily make yourself at any cooking area in the entire game by just tossing a couple common components together. Why did I have to solve an optional puzzle that was difficult to get a standard item that you can get in the game in two seconds? It doesn't make any sense. So I was actually talking to my wife about this last night and we came to the determination. What it sounds like happened was much as what happens in these games, you have different groups working on the game, correct? So you had one group who is tasked with designing the puzzles in the temples, right? So all their, their task was was make a challenging puzzle. So they did that, right? They say, here, here's a puzzle. The standard one is here. The extra one is here. It's an increase in difficulty, you know, estimated 20 minutes to complete or whatever, right? But then you had another team, and that team is working on item placement. Oh, whereabouts in the game should certain items be for plot advancement? You, you don't want to put an item too early in the game because it would be overpowered. This particular temple is early on in the game. So the item placement team, not looking at the difficulty level of the temple, just arbitrarily places an item in the temple not even realizing you had to solve a pretty difficult puzzle to get that reward so you worked your ass off to solve it to get a piece of junk right that is a disconnect in game development it should have been the teams are working together and saying wow the actual difficulty level of the challenge equates in a better reward if i'm going to work my ass off to solve this tough puzzle Give me something good. Give me a unique weapon. Give me a, a component I can combine for a unique item I've never had before. Don't give me something I already have in my inventory. Right? It's just stupid. And it pissed me off last night. It really did. I was like, why am I wasting my time? And I, to the point where I actually said to Cat last night, I might not even waste time anymore. I, since this game already is going to be so long... Maybe what I'll do is I'll go into a temple, I'll just go right for the e exit, get my, my, you know, upgrade for either health or stamina, and get the hell out of there. Like, is it even worth it to waste time on these optional objectives if eight in a row have been crap? Eight in a row have been crap. It wasn't like, oh, one of them was bad and one of them was good. It was, you know, eight in a row are terrible. So maybe I should just do that. Streamline my own playthrough, right? Find all the temples, but only get the necessary upgrades that are good, and don't bother with the other crap. But anyway, these are early observations I'm having. Keep in mind, I'm only seven hours into Tears of the Kingdom, out of a game that's supposedly over 100 hours long. So, perhaps as we continue on, right, we'll see, uh, you know, how it pans out, if it gets any better, if it gets any worse. I would hope it gets better, um, but it, it is pretty good. You know, as an initial offering, I am liking the game. I'm enjoying it. Um, but I am worried. And the reason I'm worried is this game, especially with its open world atmosphere, does seem like it's going to tend to be what we would consider a chill stream game. Meaning, yes, there will absolutely be streams set in temples that are going to be serious story progression. But at the same time, there's going to be entire streams where all we're doing is exploring this ginormous open world. And that's going to lend a lot more to conversation and a lot more to interaction to keep us busy and keep us occupied while I'm just running around exploring. And that really seems more like a late night chill stream, correct? Right? So the question is, do I treat Zelda like a late night chill stream? For now, I want to keep it in the daytime rotation. We're definitely playing it on Monday as the main stream. But then after that, like for example, we're coming near the end of Oblivion. It looks like we may beat the Shivering Isles DLC tonight. And then probably a couple more streams of just story progression. And we're probably going to beat the whole game. I mean, it's been an awesome playthrough. But at this point, we've done all the meaningful content in it, correct? So, <clears throat> what do we do once we beat Oblivion? Maybe then Zelda becomes a late night chill stream, right? And that could be a way where Zelda could be night streams, Star Wars and Elden Ring are daytime streams. That allows me to make massive progression in Star Wars and Elden Ring by the end of the month, maybe even beat one of them, right? And then 
Zelda just continues on as a chill stream for a very long time because if it's 100 hours, this could take months to beat. You see, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm not committing to that. I'm just saying that's my, my initial thoughts with how the game is panning out already, okay? But again, this is all up in the air. We're going to talk about the schedule <clears throat> in just a moment. And you guys are going to see you're going to have some control over the schedule for the rest of the week, which I'm sure you're going to like. Everyone likes to have, you know, a voice, right? A say. It's a, dem a gaming democracy here on DSP Gaming. <laughs> so, uh, we'll see. Anyway, those are my initial thoughts. And again, understand something. I like the game. I actually do like Tears of the Kingdom. I'm enjoying it. Um, actually, I'm watching the videos, and the videos look great. Like, I'm very pleased with my increase in capture and streaming quality and my new capture device. The game looks really good. Because I remembered my old uh, Breath of the Wild videos, you know, back when I was still streaming on Twitch. They didn't look so good. They were pixelized. The frame rate was constantly dipping. And I'm watching back these Tears of the Kingdom videos. I'm like, oh, they look really good. I was, I'm impressed with the quality I'm getting. I'm like, wow, my setup really has dramatically improved. I'm happy about that, being able to make improvements for you guys. And this year, I hope things are looking better. You know, this is really going to shine next month with games like Street Fighter VI, where traditionally when I play fighting games, as you notice, it'll get very pixelized, a lot of frame rate drops and everything. And I think this time around, it's just going to look way better. And I'm very pleased with the, these improvements that, that the last six plus months, right? The new setup, the new color scheme, you know what I'm saying? everything good so i'm excited now before we get to the schedule i'll just say this thank you all there's already people who are super chatting we got a couple tips today thank you so much for that remember i do shout outs in the last portion of the, the uh, podcast sorry that i'm not doing immediate shout outs but i do like to get through my topics that i, I feel i want to talk about before we get to a, you know a certain portion of the stream so thank you to everyone who is contributing i promise i will get to all of your contributions uh in a timely manner however Let's get through the, the topics, you know, the news and, and everything first. Fair enough? Okay. So, what I'd like to do is go through the schedule for the rest of the week and into next week so you guys know what to expect. Today, the first uh, session here, okay, is going to be the continuation of Star Wars Jedi Survivor. And we have some really good news. I'm finally leaving the first planet. We are 14 hours into this game. Actually, I take that back. It's about 15 hours because two of the videos were like 90 minutes long. And after 15 hours, we're finally leaving the first area. You might be like, what? Yeah, the pacing is pretty bad. The first world is huge and has so much to do in it. And a lot of it you can't even do yet until you have other abilities. And now we're finally able to leave and go do other stuff, which I'm excited for. <clears throat> but man, it took its sweet time. So today we're finally going to see a new environment, hopefully new enemies, new challenges, and I'm excited for that, for sure. Um, but I guess we're going to see, will this game continue to have all the issues it's had up to this point? Some people have told me once you leave Kobo, the first planet, that actually the performance improves in the game. I hope so. I really do. I hope the game looks better, runs better, and we don't keep having choppiness in the graphics, enemies completely vanishing from existence, the game crashing every time I try to put on a new piece of equipment I find in a chest. It, it would be appreciated if the game would actually act like a solid AAA release and not a wonky mess held together by gum and toothpicks and rubber bands. You know, I guess we'll find out today. And uh, I am excited for it. I have been enjoying the game, and I'm happy to finally jump back into it. And uh, so let's see how it goes. Three hours of Jedi Survivor today, and uh, we'll see what kind of progress I make. Okay. On tonight's late stream, 6.45 p.m. Pacific Time, it is the continuation of Oblivion, and as I've said, we are now approaching the end of the Shivering Isles DLC. Uh, the Shivering Isles DLC has lasted, what, about 10 hours, I want to say? Let me take a look. So here's the two videos there. I'm, I'm actually curious how many hours we've put into it. Um, those two were definitely, okay. Because we've been doing it for a couple of weeks at least, right? Shivering Isles DLC begins. So it started around part 65-ish. And we're about 72, 73 parts in at this point. So I'd say just under 10 hours that we've been in the Shivering Isles DLC. You know what's weird? Is that some people told me that the Shivering Isles DLC was like... It could be like 30 hours long. And I'm like, I don't know what you'd be doing. Because immediately when we showed up, we went to the city. The city has all the NPCs in it. We talked to all the NPCs and got a bunch of quests. 
We did almost all the quests, right? I think we have like one leftover quest we didn't do. <clears throat> and I think it has to do with collecting pearls, which we found like three out of four or something like that. Um, and we've just been doing the story, which is the other thing. Like, it's just kind of weird. People really sold this DLC to me like it's some epic thing. And quite frankly, I don't think the DLC's been epic. I think it's been just okay. Kind of more of the same, but it really feels like that... Uh, it really felt to me like the, this was meant to be you beat the main game. You really enjoyed Oblivion. You're sad to see it go. And then months later, oh, here's more post-game style content. This didn't feel to me like a DLC that you were meant to play during the course of the story. Because it seems like it's incredibly difficult. Which is fine. I'm not complaining about the difficulty. I'm saying it just seems like compared to the main game, this was like a huge jump in challenge. And because of that, it hasn't been that entertaining. It's been a lot of grindiness to it, right? A lot of the enemies take a 5 million hits to kill and everything. It's like, dude, this is like ridiculous over-the-top challenging. And of course, tonight, first thing we're doing is combat. We arrived in a town that's now at siege by these monsters, and of course we're going to have to fight. We'll see how it goes, I guess. But anyway, um, tonight, Oblivion, two hours of fun on the late stream as we look to wrap up Shivering Isles. I don't know if we will, but we only have like three story achievements left to fit you know in in the game meaning probably we're gonna wrap it up if not we'll get really close tonight and uh and go from there but yeah once that's wrapped up then yes we will be going back to oblivion we will be focusing on just the story to finish it and wrap up the playthrough so that we can focus on these other games for the rest of the month okay all right tomorrow monday we are going to swing back to zelda for a mainstream three hours of zelda and now yes we are absolutely in the open world we're going to start hitting up all the exploration. We're actually right at a tower, which is one of the map towers. Where it's going to open up a big part of the map of the game. And we'll probably start exploring that portion and do that for a few hours and see how it pans out. Tomorrow night will be the return of Final Fantasy V Pixel Remaster to the late stream. Which I'm excited for. We're about, from what I'm to understand, we're about halfway into the game. I thought we were like two-thirds in. But for people who have played it, they're like, nah, you're about halfway in. So we got still got a ways to go in this one, but I'm enjoying it. It's chill, retro fun. Hope you'll join me for that. And now, here's the deal. Tuesday is the day that you determine. Because right now, Tuesday's mainstream is completely up in the air. I'd be okay playing more Jedi Survivor. I'd be okay playing more Zelda. Or I'd be okay having Elden Ring return to a daytime stream. Okay? At this point, any of those, I feel, are perfectly viable options. So here's what we're going to do. Tomorrow, on the Level 1 podcast, in the morning, we're going to put up a poll. You guys are going to vote for 24 hours on what game you want to see as the main gameplay stream on Tuesday. And whatever wins the poll will be the game that we play on Tuesday's daytime stream. Okay? And then Tuesday night will be more Oblivion, where hopefully we'll be wrapping up Shivering Isles and then heading into the end game of the main game. And that's the streaming week. You know, I'm off on Wednesday. Next week, the main streams will be a focus on the new games. The late streams will be a focus on Final Fantasy and Oblivion and finishing Oblivion. Then we can take one of the daytime streams and start playing it as a night stream. You see? And then we can really start to focus a little more. Now, we do have a special event next week, okay? On Sunday, May 21st, it is DSP's Fight and Feast. That is correct. It is a fighting game extravaganza here on DSP Gaming. All day long, we'll be celebrating the history of Street Fighter. I'll be going down memory lane, and you guys will be voting on the games that I will be playing in the Street Fighter 30th Anniversary Collection. Keep in mind, there's five versions of Street Fighter 2, three versions of Street Fighter 3, and three versions of Street Fighter Alpha. You'll be able to vote on what you want to see. You'll also be able to vote on the character that I use in said game, okay? So, it's going to be a very interactive event. I'm going to be playing those games on the highest difficulty against the AI and seeing if I can do challenge runs and, and complete them in a timely manner. In addition, there will also be Tier Maker events where I'm going to be ranking fighting games or the Street Fighter games against each other. Maybe I'll be ranking fighters. It'll be depending on what I can find on Tier Maker, of course. But that should be fun as well. At least two Tier Maker rankings will take place during the course of the day. In addition to that, my wife is going to be making recipes out of the Street Fighter cookbook. And we're going to try several of these during the course of the day. What I'm going to do is read you the recipe, read you all the lore behind it, and actually do a live taste test with you to see how these recipes stack up, if they're really good food or not. Then, in addition to all of that, if you guys want, and I'm going to ask you as we get closer this weekend, would you like to see a Fantasy Battle Royale? Because if you would, I'm going to set up a 30-man Fantasy Battle Royale in WWE 2K. It's going to be all fighting game characters. 
So characters from Street Fighter against characters from Mortal Kombat against characters from Tekken. The three fighting game franchises that are all getting new installments this year will face off in a fantasy battle royale. And it's going to be really fun. I'll do commentary over it. Usually you guys really like this event. It's only if you want it. We don't have to do it. I think we'd have more than enough to do. But if you want to see that as like the big finale of the event, we could do that. Okay. It seems like a lot of people are saying yes, they'd like to see that. In the chat, at least right now. Okay. And... I have another, one other thing to say. Ladies and gentlemen, I got something special in store. That's all I'm going to say. That's all I'm going to say. I got something special in store for one week from today, the Fight and Feast event. All right? So in one week from today, I hope you'll be here. It'll be a fun marathon-style event. <clears throat> It'll certainly be exciting, interesting, and different. And this is a way to hype up the release of Street Fighter VI in just a little, you know, a week and a half after that. All right? I hope you guys will get back into the fighting game mentality. You're going to want to see fighting games again here on DSP Gaming. So it's going to be exciting. I hope you guys will be there if you can. If not, of course, the whole thing will be on demand. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to split it up. Any gameplay portions will be here on this channel, including the challenge runs in the fighting games, as well as the, the Fantasy Battle Royale. However, the tier makers, as well as the food videos, will be over on DSP React. So I'll separate the content so there's, there's content for both channels for, for the week. It'll be fun. Okay, so that's coming up on the 21st. Outside of that, the only other thing really going on this month I'm interested in, there is a new game called Lord of the Rings Gollum coming out on the 25th. But, dependent on how we're doing, and let's be honest, with three major games and two minor games I'm already playing, do I realistically think I'm going to be beating tons of these games by the end of the month and, and have time for another game before Street Fighter VI comes out? Probably not. As much as I would like to say, listen, I love Lord of the Rings. I think Gollum is a great character. You know, I would love to play a game based around the character, but I don't see how that's going to work right now when I'm so inundated with other stuff. I guess what we'll do is let's see. Let's see how it goes. Let's play it by ear, <clears throat> and by the end of the month, let's judge. We still got about another week and a half before we even get to that time frame, okay? So let's see what happens, but, uh, you know, we'll go from there, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not positive or hyped up that I'm going to be able to be playing Gollum as much as I think I would like it, okay? <clears throat> okay. Alright. Okay, uh, so that is the schedule for the rest of the month. Of course, next month is going to be superb with the release of Street Fighter 6, as well as Diablo 4 and many other things going on, but we'll talk about that as we get closer to it. Alright? Alright, guys. We don't have any real game news today. I was looking into it. I didn't really see any news stories or anything going on today. Um, so really nothing much to talk about there. I think instead what we will do is we'll begin with shout-outs. We'll start answering questions, do a little bit of interaction, Q&A, etc. <clears throat> and, uh, and get that going. So on, on the YouTube side of things this morning, our first contribution came in from Matthew. And he says, it was a super chat, by the way. Thank you, Matthew. He says, Phil, I'm sorry I haven't really been around as of lately. I'm trying to avoid spoilers for Jedi Survivor. I agree the game is good but buggy. I mean, Matthew, I'll be honest with you. I haven't been playing Jedi Survivor that much. Like, this is the first time I'm playing it this week. This might be the only time I play it this week. So, you know, yeah, it, staying away hasn't really stopped you from being spoiled. I'm not really playing it. Today is like the day to stay away. <laughs> okay? But anyway, um, I hear you. And I wish it wasn't buggy. Because overall, I think the game is good. And uh, <clears throat> thank you for the super chat. Good to have you here, at least on the, in the morning. Okay? Uh, JK20 has done two super chats. The first super chat, he says, What's good, my boy, Phil a cheese steak? Well, it is Mother's Day. It is a Sunday. It is a day full of gaming. I'm excited for today. And again, I'm hoping to have, keep my mind off of stuff in my real life. Uh, you know, with a fun stream here today. So hopefully it's a good one. That's what's going on with me today. And then he did a second super chat. He says, And you're looking pretty good today. That is ridiculous. How dare you compliment my looks? Everyone knows. I look like a big, bloated, dead, floating body. Or like a, you know, a swollen... Like someone stung my face with bees. And went, zoop! Right? Let's face it. I'm getting older. I'm not getting any better. I'm not looking any better. All right? All right. Like, did you ever see one of those zombie movies? And, you know, like a really old zombie walks out. And you realize, wow, look at the amount of, you know, makeup or, 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 or visual effects or CGI, whatever it is, they had to apply to that to make it look like it's a real zombie. 
They don't have to do that with me. I'm good. I just walk right out. Hey, everyone. Like, ah! <laughs> okay. <clears throat> anyway. So thank you for the super chats there. JK20. I appreciate it. <laughs> all right. Let's get to tips. All right. So first of all, I actually received a tip earlier this morning before the stream had started. Let's take a look at this tip. So this is a pretty unique one. First of all, it's a $25 anonymous tip. The person did not provide a name. So I want to say thank you to whoever this is. Because I don't know who it is because you didn't give me a name. But I appreciate the tip. So let me dance it out of the closet. Let's get you on the leaderboard. And let's see what they have to say. Okay. Here's their message in their $25 anonymous tip. Ready? I only watch your deadly premonition playthroughs. Thank you for doing them. Well, first of all, you're welcome. Second of all, interesting, because there's only two deadly premonition games. I've played both of them. Uh, one of them is a very old playthrough that I actually did pretty close to when I moved out here about nine years ago. I remember it was on PlayStation 3, and everyone felt that it was a really, really bad version of the game because it ran like crap. But it was a quirky game. It was absolutely weird. And the plot reminded me of like Twin Peaks combined with some other weirdo stuff. Um, of course, the famous fishing scene and, mu and music came out of that game. You ready? That came out of that game. And that's a meme that's been running now in my content for almost a decade. Okay? So, a lot, you know, a lot of fun with those games. And then, of course, the sequel came out a few years ago, exclusively on the Switch. You're thinking, oh, if it's not exclusively on the Switch, designed just for that console, you know it's going to be great. Dude, that game was so bad. It ran so poorly. And what's sad about it is, it was quirky, fun, and interesting. And if it actually ran well, it probably would have been a good game. But the game performed like a piece of shit on that console to the point where half the time it was unplayable in the open world. It was just a laughable joke. Funny part is I beat it. I went through. I was probably one of the few people who actually played the whole game. Um, so here's a weird thing that I'll bring up. Because a lot of people say, I don't get it. DSP, you know, is certainly not a popular guy anymore. And listen, I'm not, I'm not going to dispute that fact. You know, on average I get where I'm... 300 viewers on a stream, if that, okay? Uh, my gameplay videos don't get a lot of views. They don't. You know, average gameplay I'm doing is like 300 views. Um, you know, a, a popular playthrough will do like maybe 1,000, you know? And uh, I'm not I'm not hot shit. No one, no one cares about me on Twitter. No one follows me. I post up. No one reads it. No one cares, you know? It's all right because I'm not making content for a large audience. I'm making content for a small curated audience in the modern day. That audience appreciates the content I make specifically for them and supports it. That's why I'm still successful. But another reason why I'm successful, all right, is because I have made content for 15 years. And someone like this person, who I don't know who they are, probably never heard from them before, goes back and is watching my old content, appreciates it, and says, oh, I love this content you've put out. Even if it's only an incredibly small portion of my content. You know, they've watched two playthroughs in 15 years of content. And what do they do? They say, wow, those playthroughs were good. And they come and they support the stream. That's what it's all about, man. Seriously. And you guys don't understand. Like, I get residual views on old videos. They still bring in ad revenue. Every once in a while, someone who everyone's never heard of comes by and supports the stream. I have patrons who've been supporting me for like seven, eight years on Patreon. And you might be like, why are they still doing that? This is why. Because I've been around so long that I have legacy supporters who love the content I've put out over the years and they will just show up to support. And that's awesome, right? Unlike someone who's only making videos for the now. You know, I make a video and it only pertains to today. And once today's gone, no one cares about that video ever again, right? That's flash in the pan popularity. What I have is long-term viewership. People who can watch my content 
10 years down the line and still enjoy it because it's a playthrough that stands the test of time that will always be there. I played Deadly Premonition, what, eight years ago? Something like that? Nine years ago? People, this person came and tipped me for it. That's amazing. Thank you so very much. And that's kind of one of the plans I always had was being a variety content creator and doing the kind of content I do is that it's going to stand out as opposed to someone who's doing daily vlogs. Those vlogs don't even appeal after that day that they're out. Who cares about the vlog, right? Or someone who's doing drama videos or someone who's, you know, that stuff, momentary popularity. But once that moment is gone, who cares? But I've been doing this for so long that people come all the time and say, wow, I love this classic playthrough, that classic playthrough. And I love that. I love that people can watch my old stuff and still enjoy it, you know? There, well, I, I know that I that I talk about this a lot, but YouTube Premium is a service that I think a lot of people sleep on and don't understand how much this would help. I want you to think about this. YouTube Premium, if everyone was using it and everyone got paid for every view they got on a YouTube channel, like with the views, even me, I don't even bring in a million views a month, but with the views I bring in, my ad revenue would like quadruple if everyone had YouTube Premium. And then it would be like, wow, all those residual views add up to support. The problem is, yeah, people don't use YouTube Premium. The old videos, a lot of the times, don't get ads, um, and a lot of people use Adblocker. But you know what I'm saying? Like, the legacy stuff lives on. It was a long time ago, okay? I actually had this interesting conversation. Of all people, listen to this, the people from Channel Awesome, which used to be called That Guy With The Glasses when I was dealing with them, okay? This year was 2010. And I had an interesting conversation. Ready? So I got on a Skype call with Rob Walker. That's the brother of Doug Walker, the nostalgia critic. And at that time, I guess it was one of the people who was the, one of the CEOs who I guess everyone hates. I think his name is Mike Michaud or whatever. I actually had a Skype call with these guys. Because this is when they were going to recruit me to be part of that guy with the glasses in 2010. And I was going to be a major part of their gaming group called Blistered Thumbs at the time. It was Basically, it was going to be Angry Joe and me were going to be the head of their gaming division. That was their plans, okay? So I sat down and I had a Skype call with these guys. And <clears throat> basically, here's what they said. They said, once you make about five years of content, all right, you're going to be good. Because once you make about five years of content, all right, essentially your content is now in syndication, Meaning, you have such a body of work out there that at any moment someone finds you today, even if particularly they're not liking what you're doing in the moment, they can go back and look at your body of work and find things they like. And that's going to always give you residual views and residual popularity and residual income, right? Now, <clears throat> definitely back then it was more so because back then, you know, we're talking 13 years ago, ad revenue was huge. And just getting residual views on videos could make you thousands and thousands of dollars. That is not the case today. You know, ad revenue on the internet has absolutely plummeted, plummeted in the last seven years, I would say. You know, it all started with the ad apocalypse in 2017. And it really just has kind of with the, with, the, with the amount of competition out there and, and the, the, these advertisers realizing that the ads aren't ever as effective. Basically goes, boo, right? But that being said... um. There is something to be said that if you have a large body of work, you still get your name out there. Even with all the slander and nonsense against me on the internet on a daily basis, people can still go back and find fun content from my past, watch it, enjoy it, and then appreciate it and support it in some way. And there's so many ways. You know, Like I said, there's people who are patrons of mine. I haven't spoken with them in years, but they used to be frequenters of my content, and they still stay patrons because they like my content. They watch it on demand. They never attend the stream. Okay, Someone like this who watched the Deadly Premonition playthroughs, loved them. I'm just going to drop Phil a random tip because I enjoyed the playthrough so much. That's what it's all about. And when you hear idiots out there say, oh, the only reason Phil's successful is because he has like two supporters. No, the reason I'm successful is because I've worked my ass off for 15 years. So even though I'm not popular today, because the work I put in years prior, I'm still able to do what I love and make a living doing it. Do you understand? You get it? It was called work ethic. And the work ethic pays off over time. That's why I'm still here today. All right? So anyway, it's pretty awesome. I, I, I enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Whoever that was, because again, I don't know who that is. Thank you so very much for a very, very generous tip. That is very, very nice of you, and I really appreciate it. Continuing on. Um, 
<clears throat> Actually, JK did a third super chat. I said, happy Mama's Day, Philly boy. How's the wife and family? Everyone's good. Everyone's good. We're staying cool. I wouldn't be surprised if my wife is turning on the air conditioners right now because today is supposed to be, again, high 80s or, or, or low 90s here in Washington. But outside of that, we're chill. Should be a good day. Okay. Continuing on. I received a $2 tip. Uh, Hotel Dude has tipped $2 and says, my turn to try to contribute and get the vest street going. We'll talk about that in a second since he brought it up. Could I get a shout out for Jonas, a real Copenhagen star? No idea what that means, but okay, shout out to Jonas. Cheers from Denmark, and you, again, you could call me Hotel Dude. All right, Hotel Dude. Well, thank you for the $2 tip. Now, if you're wondering what he's talking about when he said vest street, okay? Many of you may have no clue. So, three years ago, we were doing a special retrospective marathon as an event here on DSP Gaming. We were going down memory lane. In fact, this might have been my last retrospective event. I don't even remember. We were going down memory lane. We were watching old videos. We were having a good time. And we just so happened to be watching a random, like, channel update vlog that I had done maybe, like, 10 years prior, okay? And in the vlog, I happened to be wearing a vest, a, a beige vest. And everyone's like, do you have that? Do you have, it's like a puffy jacket style vest. It's like, do you still have that? Because we've never seen you wear that in any kind of recent time frame. You know, and I was like, well, you know what it is, is I moved out to Washington. When I move out here, all the weather out here is different. I don't really wear that kind of clothing anymore. You know, if I go out, I'll wear like, I have a leather jacket. I wear my leather jacket out or whatever if it's colder in the winter or fall. But outside of that, I, I wouldn't really be wearing that kind of like puffy vest anymore. That was like more Connecticut style clothing from where I came from. I said, I don't know if I have it, honestly. Let me go look. So I go, and I go downstairs, all right? And I go into my closet downstairs. And lo and behold, I come out of the closet, and there it is. And it looks brand new. It's like unworn, all right? And people are like, holy crap, you still have it? That's the one from over a decade ago you have. It. I was like, yeah, look, it's brand new. It didn't even, you know, it didn't fall apart. It's really good quality, right? And people were like, well, why don't you wear it? I was like, well, I'm not going to wear it indoors. That's stupid. You know, I don't need to wear a jacket indoors. So what we came up with the idea was that since I'm now an interactive live streamer, right, if I raise a certain amount of funds, you know, support in this particular stream, I'll put on a vest. And so we started this, this practice. If I raise $100 on any particular stream, I'll put on a vest. Um, somehow, and I don't know how, this idea took off. Ladies and gentlemen, we hit an unprecedented vest streak. How many was it? I don't even know how many it was, but it was. It lasted like three months. It was like, I want to say it was like March or April, and it lasted through like July. I, I'm completely wrong probably with the timing, but it was about, It was. people are saying 270, 250. It was something like 250, 260, 270 straight streams. I do two streams a day, right? So you're talking, yeah, it was like a, a three to four month streak where every single stream I was raising $100 in tips. It was tr superb, tremendous, right? It helped a lot because at that point I was going through a bankruptcy, all right? I had no money. Uh, all my money was going to, to you know, bills and, and, and lawyers and, and all kinds of shit. And basically if that hadn't happened, I would have been way hard up. And it was really helpful at that time in my life to have that support. And... So it was called the Vest Street. We actually had a, a, a thing at the bottom of the screen that said Vest Street. For every stream, when we hit the Vest goal, another number added to the street, right? But I'll be honest with everyone, because you guys know me. It kind of got annoying, and here's why it got annoying. Of course, not because I was being supported. That was amazing. The level of support I was receiving was outstanding, tremendous, over-the-top positive, okay? But basically what happened was people started coming to the streams and let's be honest it was trolls it was people who pretended like they were fans but they were here to derail my content and they would come to the streams and they'd be like oh is phil gonna hit the vest goal oh the goal is he hitting the goal what vest is he gonna wear will there be a vest today the vest event and basically the whole chat would end up being you know vest 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 and it's like what the fuck dude right absolutely positively bullshit and I don't want my whole stream to be about that I don't want everyone on a stream to be talking constantly about 
income to be talking about support levels, all right? If someone's going to mention it, it should be me. I'm the one running the business. I'm the one running everything. So if I feel the need to do a plug and say, hey, guys, if you want to support the stream, please do this, this, that's on me. That's not on the viewer. But what happened was we had people, I mean, we had dozens of people coming in a day with sock accounts and everything. And all, oh, the vest, the vest streak, the vest, the vest. And it got annoying. Even my, my viewers who were here for gameplay were like, dude, this is too annoying now. Like, this vest streak is kind of like a double-edged sword. I mean, yeah, it's a blessing because you're getting all this support, but the content is, the quality is dropping because it's just annoying to hear these idiots talking about it constantly. We don't want to hear that. So eventually the vest streak ended. And after that, things tapered off. You know, I still get great support. All right, but it's not a regular thing that we're hitting goals. Now, by the way, since then we, we've even instituted different changes. You know, I left Twitch. I lost a lot of income when I left Twitch. <clears throat> I came over here to YouTube, and we tried. We actually adjusted the goals. Now we have three tiers of goals: a fifty-dollar goal, a hundred-dollar goal, and a hundred fifty-dollar goal. It's gunner glasses at fifty, a, a hat of your choice at a hundred, and a vest of your choice at a hundred fifty. Okay, so things are different now, years later, but very rarely are we hitting these goals? And quite frankly, you know, I'm not harping on it. Overall, in a day, I do really well for a streamer of my size. I mean, ridiculous. I have some of the most supportive viewers on this planet, and I know that. I'm incredibly grateful for it, okay? So I'm not going to sit here and harp on it every day, you know. But in, in the, for the most part, things are good. But then this week, all of a sudden, we started hitting the goals every stream. And I'll be honest, <clears throat> it's a combination of regulars coming and doing their regular support combined with someone named Jinx, who just started showing up <clears throat> and contributing, not only with tips, but also gifting memberships to the channel. And I'll be honest, I don't know who Jinx is. Jinx says that there's someone who's a longtime supporter. They said, I've been watching you since way back in the day. I appreciate all the content you put out, and now I can support your channel, okay? And listen, I really appreciate that. However, I know someone like this, they're not going to last forever. They're not going to be here on every stream. They're not going to support every stream. But literally, six streams in a row, we have hit the goals. All the goals. The gunner glasses, the hat, and the vest. So that's tremendous. And that has not happened. I don't think we've had a six-stream streak like that. We haven't had that since... I can't even remember. The vest... I don't think it was the vest streak. Because I think we have had six days in a row where we hit goals, but it's like very rare. Even during the biggest releases, you know, Resident Evil 4 earlier this year, uh, last year, even Elden Ring, I don't think we were hitting six straight days where we were hitting all the goals like that. So this is unprecedented, except for the Vest Streak three years ago, you see? So that's why people are saying, oh, it's the Vest Streak. The Vest Streak is back. Here's the thing. I don't want to make my content about that ever again. I learned from my mistake three years ago how it became all about talking about the vest streak and the support and the vest streak. I don't want it to be like that anymore, all right? That's why I'm not going to put vest streak down here on the leaderboard, and we're going to start counting. We're not going to do that. You guys want to count it. I'm not going to stop you, but I'm not going to sit here and make every single stream about the vest, the vest, the vest. Can we hit the vest goal, the vest? We're not doing that, okay? So I'm just going to forewarn everyone. If people sit around and start doing this and start making it all about that, and essentially derail the streams and make it that we can't concentrate on the gameplay and have good talk anymore. And instead it's about vest, vest, vest. You're not going to be here. You're going to be gone. Just like everyone else causing drama. Just like everyone else who derails my streams. It's not allowed. Because that's what it is. It, that's exactly what it's called. Derailing. That's what it was three years ago. People coming to the streams, they didn't care what game I was playing. They didn't care what we were talking about. They literally came in here to talk about money to make it look like that's all I care about. When that's not the case. I'm putting out meaningful content for my audience first. And if I get to get support or make a living doing it, uh, you know, that goes hand in hand with putting out good content people like. But that's kind of the icing on the cake. Primary, you know, focus, the number one thing I'm, I'm, you know, focused on is having a good time with you and making good content for you. All right? So it's been amazing this week. So far, six straight streams of hitting all of our goals. Both, by the way, tips goals and membership goals because we've exceeded member goals every day too. That's why we're 100 members more than we were just three days ago, you see? So this has been outstanding. Can we keep it up? I have no idea. Am I going to freak out if we don't? No. It's not a big deal if we don't. Support comes and goes. Things get good. Things get slow. It's all good. It all evens out in the end, and it's all a good time. As long as we're having a good time together, that's all that matters, man. So I'm not going to make it all about that. Understand that. 
And I don't want to see people sitting in the chat constantly talking about Jinx because he's been a supporter for three days and talking shit. And, and be, where is he? What's going on with Jinx? Fuck off. It's none of your business. Why are you stalking Jinx, right? Fuck you. Grow up and leave him alone. Because if I see it, you're gone. Okay. Let's continue. Ladies and gentlemen, I received a generous tip. See who this is from. Wow. A $75 tip. $75 just came in, ladies and gentlemen. Wow. Let's go ahead and get... It. What animation would that be? <clears throat> I guess that would be the $50 animation. Yes. So let's get the gunner glasses on. <clears throat> Here we go. There we go. So a $75 tip has come in and it is from the same person who tipped the $25. He says, this is the same person who sent the Deadly Premonition donation. Your playthrough of the first game is super entertaining and it got me out of some bad times, so this is the least that I can do. You see what I'm saying, guys? Thank you again, whoever this is, because I don't know who this is. They very likely maybe have never been on a stream, but they're watching now and they see, you know, what I had to say. Thank you so very much. That is super duper appreciated. With that $75, <clears throat> we have now hit the hat goal. <clears throat> so now, you guys can vote on a hat. Thank you very, very much again. De I should call him the Deadly Premonition Appreciator. <laughs> Thank you for the very generous tip. And now we're going to do a hat goal. Now, here's the fun thing about this, okay? We have now worn so many hats that we kind of have to redo the rotation because I've worn almost all of them in the last week, okay? So, <clears throat> which hat is Star Wars best? Okay, let's think about hats that maybe I did wear recently, but now we kind of want to hit the reset button <clears throat> on them. So some people ask about the, the King's Crown. The King's Crown is not a great hat to wear because it doesn't really sit on my head and it deflates. So sadly, that King's Crown is not really viable. Only if like we're in a rush or at the end of a stream and I can wear it for like 25 minutes or something. But for a stream, I'm going to wear it the whole time. The King's Crown doesn't really work. Um, same thing with the fishing hat. Like the fishing hat, I would it's not very comfortable. I'd much rather wear that during the summer months if we're doing something around then. So that's not going to be eligible for now. Um... So let's see, what hats have I not worn recently? I didn't wear the Deadpool hat. I didn't wear the beanie, which it could be either Punisher or, or, or Daredevil. However, we well, get Pikachu hat on there because I haven't worn the Pikachu hat in a while. And uh, I guess also we could do the pilot military hat, which I haven't worn in a while. There you go. So please vote on those hats. Let's see what people want for the rest of today. Okay. Um, so Wolf's Paradox did a super chat. Now Wolf's Paradox, just so you know, first of all, I appreciate it. It's a $20 super chat. I'm going to cut out half of it because half of it is bullshit. The other half I've already addressed, but it just might be that now it's been about two months and people don't realize. So I will answer what you're saying. Um, so in a nutshell... Basically, what Wolf's Paradox is saying is that he's seeing a lot of positivity on the internet around people who, pro you know, recently had a lot of negativity associated with them, correct? Um, and he says, do you think that I would have benefited from something like that if during the interview with side scrollers I had shown screenshots to Craig of the mobile game, all right? So here's the thing. I've already addressed this. This has already been explained, but no one listens to my answers, all right? No one wants to hear the answers, all right? I'm on this podcast with side scrollers, all right? And Craig's like, if you're innocent of all these claims of spending money on mobile games, which is ludicrous, that doesn't even a claim against me and anyone gives a fuck about it because it has nothing to do with me or my content at all. 
It's the most ludicrous bullshit from outside the streams. It has nothing to do with anyone's business or anything. It's false, but it's still bullshit anyway. It shouldn't affect anyone's judgment or anything. It's just nonsense. It's fucking bullshit. Okay? And it pisses me off that we have to talk about it because it's fucking nonsense. It's so stupid. But anyway, since this is what they wanted to harp on in the interview, out of all the things to talk about, this is what they harped on in the interview, right? During the interview, the host of the interview, Craig, said, can you just send me a screenshot of the game, right, to prove your innocence? And what did I say? I said, I would probably consider and be willing to do it, but I'm not going to do it live on the show, all right? Now, why didn't I do it live on the show? It's very simple, because it wouldn't have proved anything, all right? These accounts, these mobile game accounts, even though they're not supposed to be transferable, are. There's a whole market for them online. Right now, you can go online and search WWE Champions account, and you can buy one right now, even though you're not supposed to be able to. You can buy it from someone, and you own that account, and it's a transfer of the account. You understand? So if I had just taken a screenshot and sent them a screenshot of my real account, it literally would have proven nothing. They would, oh, you see, so that's easily bullshit. It's easily doctored because he bought someone else's account or whatever. The real way to prove your innocence in a case like this needs to actually show all the corroborating evidence, okay? So what does that mean? It means I would have had to show my account, all the information tied to the account. Now, I have a, 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 you know, a phone. So I could show things, for example, there's a, on, on iPhones, there's something called Game Center. And I could have shown that on Game Center, there's an account associated with Game Center. And that's, you know what I'm saying? That's the account that I'm using. It's not the account I'm accused of using and all that. In addition, I could have showed all the other games that I've ever played on Game Center. And I was going to actually show other games that I play currently to show all my information that it's all real. It's all the same name and everything associated with all those accounts. That that's my account. That's what I really use. So the only way to prove innocence isn't just do a quick screenshot and show, show it on a podcast. It wouldn't have ever work. It would have immediately been debunked. Oh, that's a fake account. He sold it. But if I can show all the corroborating evidence, right? Here's the account. Here's how it ties to this ID. Here's other accounts in that name for corroboration. Here's your body of evidence to prove what I'm saying is true. Then it would have been fine. And I actually, I already explained this. I don't say, I'm getting asked again two months later. People already forgot my answers. Immediately after that show ended, I actually did all this. I made all, I, I made, you know, to all the screenshots, proved all of it, had all of it there, okay? All the evidence showing this is my real account, it ties to this ID, to this, you know, this account, and here's other accounts in other games that's the same ID. You can show it's the one I've been using for years and years. I had all of this ready to go. And I emailed Craig and I said, are you ready? Because I want to make sure you're actively looking at your email account. I want to send this to you so you can look at it, but I, I can't have you staring at it or have a chance that someone else will get it. You got to delete it. This is my personal information. This is tied to things like my Apple account. And if this gets out, they're going to ruin it all for me. They're going to ruin all my accounts. They're going to fuck it all up because they've done shit like that before. So I send him the email and he ignores it. He completely ignored the email. Only for me to get an email the next day saying, yeah, we slammed you all this morning on our podcast because we don't believe you. And it's like, so essentially he didn't care. He never believed me. He wasn't going to believe me. You understand? Like, they already had preconceived notions in their heads of what the deal was based on watching two weeks of detractor content. Right? There was absolutely no chance they were going to believe anything I said. If I sent them the screenshot, oh, well, he bought someone else's account. That's not evidence of anything. When I actually said, give me a few minutes after the show, let me take a half an hour to show all the evidence, create the packet of evidence you need to show my real stuff. And I said, I want to send it to you. Are you ready? He ignored me. And then the next day he said, don't bother sending it. I don't want it. We already slammed you on our show. So there you go. But of course, I'm supposed to believe that they were so objective. And it, the interview appeared objective. After the fact, their behavior proves it wasn't. It proves the whole thing was a setup. They watched two weeks of the tractor content. They never watched a single one of my answers. They never asked a single one of my fans who likes my content, what do you like about Phil? What's a positive spin on this? All they wanted to do was sit there and watch dumb shit from fucking It's a Gundam and other idiots who all they do is regurgitate the same fucking memes every day. And they all took it all at face value as being true. And because I couldn't immediately provide them with evidence of innocence, that's it, he's lying. So fuck it. And that's what I said. I'm, I'm done with this. I'm not ever 
going to waste time doing interviews and shit like this ever again because I don't believe there's a single person on the internet who will give me a fair shake. They're all in it for their own agendas. They're all in it to get over. Because take a look at how they got over for the next two weeks. It was constant. Let's talk about Phil. Here's a related topic similar to Phil. I mean, shit, they just interviewed Boogie. Do you think they would have fucking interviewed Boogie if they didn't have me on the show first? It's a no-brainer. So now this is an ongoing stream of benefits that they're going to have because they had me on the show. So it was pretty... Now it's pretty clear-cut what was going on. Back then it wasn't. I actually thought I could trust Craig, but sadly the thing was was done in a way that there was no way they were ever going to believe me to begin with. How else can you explain that I literally said to him right after the show, dude, I have all the evidence for you. I'd like to send this to you, but I just want to be sure you're at your email. Can you take it? And he ignored me for a day, only so he could do a negative show about me the next day, profit from my haters, and then email me later. Oh, by the way, yeah, we don't believe you. Too bad. So, fuck that. Fuck all that nonsense. And, uh, but again, this is not anything I've already said. I've already said it, but now it's two months later. So I guess every couple of months I have to re reiterate the exact same thing I said two months ago because people didn't listen the first time. I don't know what else to say. All right, <laughs> it really is. So, there you go, okay? Um, and that's that. Like I said, I'm done with that. I'm absolutely not going to be bothering with that nonsense ever again. I don't see a reason to address it. As you know, in two months, we're done talking about it. And has anything horrible happened in the last two months? It has no, Again, it has nothing to do with my streams. It has nothing to do with my content. It has nothing to do with the, the quality of stuff I put out for my viewership on the internet. And they don't care about it. So that's why I don't want to bring it up. So I'm okay bringing it up now just to reiterate what I've already said. But outside of that, there's no point in ever talking about it ever again. Okay? <clears throat> okay, let's continue. Um... Grog, what's going on? Good to see you here this morning. Grog has done a super chat. It says, Phil, I'm loving your Final Fantasy V playthrough. Always glad to see you doing what you love. Take care. Thank you. And Grog, like, seriously, that's exactly what that playthrough is. That's like, that's a love letter to the games I grew up playing in the 1990s. You know what I'm saying? Like, the classic turn-based RPGs, really, really enjoying that kind of stuff. You see what I'm saying? I love that. Even though it's not for my main audience. I know when I play Final Fantasy V, I'm not getting tons of people on the streams. I'm not getting a ridiculous amount of support. But I'm having a ton, a ton of fun with that playthrough. So, okay. And the Wolf's Paradox did a follow-up super chat. Thank you, Grog, by the way, for the super chat. It's good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Uh, Wolf's Paradox did a super chat. I'm not trying to bring up any drama for drama's sake. I'm trying to figure out ways that you can maybe get less hate. It's never going to happen. The, Wolf's Paradox, here's the thing. We've now realized, right? Even people on the internet who normally would be fair have now realized it benefits us more to hate Phil than to not because it is such a mob mentality of hate against me. If you were to say, I don't hate Phil, maybe we should give him a fair shake, you'll actually get shit on on the internet. So people are not going to do that. They're going to ride the wave of negative memes to benefit for personal gain. Right? That's exactly what they're going to do. And my haters will always support that too. Anyone who shits on me, they're going to go support, right? So of course, people are going to do it. It's immediate personal gain. And people can't resist it. People are greedy. People are selfish. People don't want to give someone a fair shake. People don't want to see two sides of an issue at all. They just want to see what benefits me today. Let's do it. Let's crap on someone and get that money. So that's it. I don't think it's ever going to change. It's going to be me continuing to put out meaningful content to my audience, all right? And that's all I care about. I don't care about any of this other white noise on the outside or how many morons try to pull me into their bullshit. I'm not going to fucking fall for that nonsense. I'm just going to be here and enjoy the content that I do with my audience every day, all right? I don't care about everyone else's opinion. They could all go to hell. Okay. NDO103 has just tipped me $50. NDO, thank you so very much. And with that tip, it is official. We have hit our full tips goal for the day. Or for the stream, I should say. Ladies and gentlemen, which means we will have a vest. Which means, yes, the streak does continue. 
And by the way, Jinx isn't even here today. So there you have it. Jinx, at least as of yet, Jinx is not even on the stream. And we have already hit our best goal for today. So thank you very much to those who are supporting. I really appreciate that. Is is the vest streak back? Again, it's not all about that. I'm not going to put it on the leaderboard. But thank you guys for supporting in the way you are. It is absolutely amazing. Okay. So yes, we will have a poll for a vest shortly. Uh, I received, uh, let's see here. How much is this? I don't even care. Someone someone tipped a dollar and says, are you aware that people post emojis to make fun of you? I don't care. If they have to do these really stupid, like, behind-the-scenes, like, inside-joke detractor emote memes, I, I don't care. I mean, if anything, that should be a red badge of, of, of uh, like, a scarlet letter that they're wearing on their, on their fucking cells, how stupid they are, right? I just want you to think about that. We have a secret emote that we all use in Phil's chat. And the secret emote is actually a way to hate on Phil. But only the detractors understand it because it's only from a detractor circle. So if you want to prove that you're an idiot, you use that emote, I guess, right? Like, I don't even know what else to say. Really, like, go ahead. I don't care. I mean, I'm not going to recognize it. No one sees it unless you're in the chat. No one sees it, right? So why the fuck do I care about it? Well, who gives a shit? <laughs> you can't make this stuff up. I received a $10 tip from Jay Nicholson. In your opinion, is it worth buying Jedi Survivor now after these patches? Phil, remember, you're my number one guy. So it's supposed to be Jack Nicholson playing the Joker. Remember, you're my number one. And actually, wasn't, wasn't it... Uh, wasn't it Jack Palance who played the gangster before him, if I remember correctly? You're my number one guy. Anyway, um, that's in the Tim Burton original Batman movie. It's a great movie. Um, so we're at 1006, all right? And I hate to say it, I don't think the game has improved at all, has it? Like, let's be honest here. Did any of those patches improve the gameplay experience? Did anyone even notice any change? I didn't. Like, you would think, oh, it's supposed to improve performance or whatever. I didn't notice any change. It looks exactly the same to me. So I don't think that the patches did anything. Um, quite frankly, we're still having game bugs and crashes. <clears throat> we're still having enemies vanish into thin air. We're still having really disgusting, distorted, contorted death animations, right? So no, I don't think that any of that is, uh, is improving anything, quite frankly. Um... <laughs> So, no, I mean, is it worth buying? Well, depends on your version. I've heard PS5 version is the best. I've heard P a PC version is the worst. You see the version I'm playing and how it performs. I mean, if you're okay with a game that has a good story, right? Good world design, interesting puzzles, and interesting combat, but it's played with bad graphics and game bugs, I mean, yeah, then get it. But it's really hard for me to say it's a must-buy. I don't think it is. I think that, that actually the the shortcomings of a game that should be AAA but feels more like a, a, a B movie game because of all its joking issues you know it's like it's like a laugh it's like I said it's a comedy of errors the game's good then all of a sudden something funny something stupid happens funny like you laugh okay but then it happens again you're like oh what it happens again you're like what the fuck how did they fuck this up so bad right <clears throat> anyway there you go so your your ability to judge Mr. Nicholson for yourself but uh you know, it ain't a polished experience, that's for sure. Um, I received another dollar. And this is just nonsense. So I'm just going to ignore it. It's just a troll. I'm just going to ignore it. Uh, Retro did a, a $20 super chat. Thank you, Retro. says, I don't hate you, Phil. Well, thank you, Retro. I'm glad you don't hate me. I don't know why you felt the need to say that. I didn't think that you hated me. But thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that very much. Okay. <clears throat> All right, guys. We're about to wrap up the podcast. So, by the way, 
The military hat slash pilot hat has one. You know, I call it the M. Bison hat, but we haven't played Street Fighter in a long time. It's hard to associate it with M. Bison when Bison's not around. Uh, and I don't think Bison's in Street Fighter VI, although there's a lot of uh, speculation that the character JP may be M. Bison in another body, or maybe have some relation to M. Bison or Shadowloo in general. Um, but anyway, let's do a poll for the vest. And I'll toss the hat on for the end of the show here. Which vest is Jedi best? So at this point, what vests have we not worn? We've worn almost all of them. We have definitely have not worn the camo vest, okay? We did not wear the blue vest. Those are the two we have not worn, correct? We wore gray, beige. Oh, we didn't wear the red vest, did we? I guess I don't remember wearing the red vest. So we'll say red. Because I don't remember wearing the red. Um, and we wore we just wore platinum. We just wore gold. We just wore denim. We just wore the McFly vest. And we just wore beige. But what was the sixth vest that I wore? Oh, gray. So there's the six we just wore. All right. So the other one would be Pokemon. <clears throat> the Pokemon vest. So camo, blue, red, or Pokemon vest. Keep in mind, whatever I'm wearing is going to go with the military hat, which I'll grab. Okay. Oh, okay. So by the way, time to ban some idiots who want to say fucked up stuff. Like this moron right here. Okay. So please vote. And uh, thank you. Last chance. Does anyone have a last question or anything you'd like to say before we begin with Star Wars today? Last chance to get your question in and get it addressed. <clears throat> Expand Donk says, I don't think it's fair to criticize Jedi's pacing. You're spending four to five hours or 15 hours fighting two optional frogs. Wrong. Uh, that's not true. I spent two hours on the double frog fight, and I spent about one hour to, to 90 minutes on the single frog fight. So even if you want to argue three and a half hours, you'd still say the first planet is about 12 hours long instead of 15. Still, still too long. Still ridiculously slow pacing. Definitely what should have happened is you go to the first planet, you do a little bit of exploration, get to the town. The town has one or two missions, a little bit of exploration. You're out of there within eight hours. Now you're off to the first planet. Instead, they draw it out and they have all this optional shit there. They're like, well, I want to do it, but I can't do it because I don't have the abilities. It just makes it feel very weird. Like that should have been the, the, the first next planet you go to. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> uh, I'm calling my mother uh, after the stream, actually. I call my mother between the streams to see how she's doing today. I hope she got my... I sent her a, a Mother's Day card over a week ago because mail is so bad in the United States right now that sometimes you mail something and it can take three weeks to get there. But I mailed her a card like two weeks ago. I hope she got it. Yes. Uh, what is meaningful is subjective. That is absolutely correct. That I mean, that's a given. No? No one's asked me anything. So I guess we're good to end it and uh, and then jump into the game then, right? Are we? No one's saying anything, so I guess... Alright, so ladies and gentlemen, we will uh, adjourn. Today's level one... What happened to the platinum vest? We just wore it. We just wore the platinum vest... Yesterday? Yeah, we wore it yesterday. Yep. What's going on, Jade? It's good to have you here today. How you doing? Do I like Pokemon? Of course I like Pokemon. Is it worth buying Kingdom Hearts 1 through 3 for 55 bucks? I mean, it's pretty good value for three full-length games. Keep in mind, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2 do play very outdated, but they're actually quite good games. They're better than 3. So, it's your call. Just don't expect to ex uh, understand the story. You won't. Only playing those three games, you'll have no clue what the fuck's going on. You have to play all the spin-offs to understand it. I have gotten 100% of achievements in a game before. Yes, I have. 
Good. I'm glad you're feeling good, Jade. Thoughts on a Fallout 4 next gen upgrade? That'd be neat. If I'm ever going to replay Fallout 4 to play it on current gen would be kind of cool, I think. Will Virtual Fighter return? Probably never. There really is no competitive community for Virtual Fighter. Um, <clears throat> I played it casually as much as I could to the point where I was losing enjoyment because people were basically hitting me up with stuff that was like frame trap shit that I didn't understand. And I was like, okay, I think that's enough of that. I'm not going to invest that much time into it. So, Felipe, if you would like to know if I'm enjoying Tears of the Kingdom, watch today's podcast. I talked all about it earlier on the show. <clears throat> okay. Guys, I think it's time to adjourn. Thank you for a great podcast. Thank you for the overwhelming support. Like I said, it's pretty cool we have this level of support. <clears throat> and the idiots who come and say, oh, the only way Phil will ever get that support is with one person. And here we are today. That one person who's been super supportive for six straight streams is not even here. And here we are hitting all the goals. That's very nice of everyone. Thank you so much for that. I hope you're enjoying your springs. If you indeed are in spring, <clears throat> stay safe. And I'll see you soon.